So, welcome to this class on uh, monosynaptic and other reflexes. So, uh, most of this is going to be so monosynaptic reflexes. So, we have been discussing in the last two classes uh, the case of monosynaptic reflexes. In today's class, we will discuss two other things. We have introduced these notions earlier, the concept of uh, one a interneuron and uh, the special inhibitory interneuron in the motor circuit is the Renshaw cell and uh, in today's class we will talk about 1 B interneuron, we will talk about stretch reflex, alpha gamma coactivation, how these reflexes can also be modulated by descending influence or those that involve brain circuits or what are also called as long loop reflexes. Let us remind ourselves of this case of uh, the monosynaptic reflex. What does this do? This resists the lengthening of a given muscle. So, if a muscle is stretched or lengthened, the muscle spindles 1A afferents fire and cause contraction or, or they excite the alpha motor neurons of the same muscle and cause contraction or prevent stretching in some sense. For a long time, for centuries it was thought that this is actually a property of the muscle, this is like a passive property, this is not related to control. For a long time this was believed, only just about 100 years ago it was found that if you transect the dorsal roots, right? if you transect the dorsal roots this response disappears. So, if you cut the dorsal root, what happens is you there is a big difference between the dorsal root intact. When the dorsal root is intact, this is what is found, right? And when the dorsal root is cut, this is what is found. Big difference. So, this means that the dorsal root is absolutely necessary for this function this was first and as the muscle length is changing. So, the muscle length is increasing. So, the muscle length is or the muscle is stretched as the muscle is stretched in the in the presence of an intact dorsal root you are going to have a relatively strong response such as that. If the dorsal root is uh, cut even though there is a stretching even though there is a stretching the response is going to be relatively weak this means that dorsal root is essential at least forms an essential part of this. From uh, Liddell and Sherrington you have to see the year just to give you a context yes, 1924. Okay. So, this is data from 1924 from Liddell and Sherrington for the first time showing that you know the information coming from the dorsal root plays an important crucial role in modulating the reflex responses. So, this means that, uh, so that that is how we realize the importance of uh, one a of and so there was even a question as to how do you know that this is how it works. Many of these things are not seen, the neurons are not seen, the, these are just pictorial representations. So, this picture for example, is a pictorial representation of our impression of what is going on. What is actually going on is not exactly seen, but understood through latencies. This is classic neurophysiology, understood through latencies. The if you excite uh, one a uh, afferent at the dorsal root, the response at the ventral root of corresponding alpha motor neurons is found at approximately uh, um, slightly less than. 1 millisecond and since we know that the synaptic transmission is about 0 0.5 milliseconds to 0 0.8 or 0 0.9 milliseconds, we know this must essentially involve a monosynaptic pathway. So, many of these things are found through, uh, through accurate measurements of latencies. By computing these latencies, we are able to come up with how many synapses are involved in this process. So, this is how it is done. Okay. So, 
what is the use of all these reflexes? Uh, so, uh, a slight de slight uh, deviation from the topic. What is the use of all these reflexes? You see, uh, reflexes provide, uh, in some sense, a crude response, a response to a stimulus, right? It need not be, you know, per perfectly acceptable to the context, but it provides a response. In many cases, it is performing some protective function. In other words, it is, for, for example, if there is a painful stimulus, let us assume that this is a, you know, a, a nail and I am placing my finger on it, or this is a hot object and I am placing my finger on it, right. If it is only slightly hot, I am going to place and, you know, withdraw. Note the point at which the sensory information is collected is at this point, which is the finger. It is not the finger alone that is withdrawing. You see, the response is found here, is it not? The response is found at proximal, more proximal sites, leading to a relatively, a relatively, qui relatively quick uh, withdrawal from the painful stimulus. If it was very hot, let us assume that it was very hot, actually many more muscles are uh, activated leading to a complete withdrawal like for example, the response could be like that. I, of course, this, uh, this, this particular example that I am giving in obviously involves polysynaptic pathways, it is not monosynaptic. In other words, this response is activating circuitry that activates multiple muscles is it not, because the activation involves you know withdrawal at uh, the elbow, at the shoulder, at the wrist, etcetera, multiple joints that means multiple muscles must be activated. Obviously, it involves polysynaptic pathways, not monosynaptic, that is okay. But still, still we should remember that this is also considered a reflex or this is also called as the flexion withdrawal uh, uh, response, right. So, that means it also involves a coordination of multiple muscles. It does two things. First is it activates the fluxors are right uh, and inhibits the extensors. So, there is simultaneous activation of one group of muscles and uh, inhibition of the other group of muscles. Not just that, there is more. Suppose this painful stimulus is on my leg, on my right leg. Say, I am walking and there is a nail and uh, I am, let us say that I am not wearing a footwear, I am at my home or whatever, I am not wearing a footwear and walking, there is a painful stimulus. Right. What happens is that you know immediately I withdraw the leg by flexing the, uh, the knee, flexing at the knee, but that means the extensors are inhibited, extensors are inhibited, flexors are activated. What happens that is at the right leg, is it not? Because the painful stimulus is felt at the right leg. What happens at the left leg is the opposite. At the left leg, what happens is the extensors are activated and the flexors are inhibited. Why? Because I have only two legs. If I remove the right leg, the entire load of my body, uh, the entire weight of my body is going to be rested with one, just one leg. So, I should ensure that that is going to get the maximum uh, support. That is possible by ensuring that the extensors are activated. So, let us remember what, what is going on. It is a bit more complicated than what is shown here. So, what is happening? is simultaneous activation of flexors and inhibition of extensors of the limb that is experiencing the painful stimulus and this is called as flexor withdrawal response, okay, a polysynaptic response. The other case is the crossed extension reflex in which case uh, you know the, the other limb, the limb on the other side of the body experiences uh, you know extension okay more details on this just wanted to give why these things are even being studied just wanted to talk about that a little bit okay and let's remind ourselves of uh, what the one a inhibitory interneuron does uh, so the one a inhibitory interneuron is activated is excited by the one a afferent and is inhibited by the renchasen okay it, what it does is uh, it regulates contraction in the antagonist muscle. So, if the muscle of interest is biceps, it uh, one a inhibitory interneuron 
that receives inputs from the biceps regulates contraction of the triceps okay, of the antagonist muscle. So, let us also remember there are uh, so it receives multiple inputs not just from uh, I have only mentioned two sources right not just from uh, the Renshaw cell and not just from one afferent it also receives inputs from the descending system and that can both be excitatory and inhibitory from corticospinal and other descending pathways. So, there are multiple inputs. So, but there is only a single uh, one a interneuron right or there are groups of these one a interneurons. So, these one a interneurons there must be a balance of excitation and inhibition depending on uh, in which direction this balance is tipped it could be tipped in favor of excitation or it could be tipped in favor of inhibition depending on that excitation or inhibition of uh, you know of the muscles innervated by this of, of the neurons that are affected by this will happen ok. So, this balance must change. So, a change in the balance allows the interneuron to coordinate muscle contract. So, this is like you know coordination happens through multiple uh, balance of multiple pathways. So, from one a afferent from Renshaw cells from corticospinal pathways and let us also remember we discussed some time ago monomenergic inputs from the brain stem etcetera etcetera all these things are received by the way monomenergic inputs go to the motor neuronal pool, but uh, the motor neuronal pool itself is inhibited by one a uh, inhibitor interneuron. So, lots of things all these things. So, there is there is just a balance that is uh, reached depending on what the balance is depending on where uh, the equilibrium is uh, settled at a given point in time the response will be determined based on that ok. And we discussed uh, what are these uh, Renshaw cells, Renshaw cells are uh, interneurons that uh, produce inhibition of the neuron that neuron that excites it and also the motor neuronal pool of the synerg synergists right. So, if biceps is contracting its Renshaw cell which in will inhibit biceps brachialis and brachioradialis all its uh, synergists and their gamma motor neurons ok. These interneurons are excited. So, that means they are excited by collaterals from several motor neurons right. So, by the way let us also remember when brachialis and brachioradialis are contracting it will inhibit everybody it will inhibit brachialis, brachioradialis and biceps. So, it will inhibit all the synergistic muscles ok. They also so they send uh, you know collaterals of synergist motor neurons and they also inhibit 1 a inhibitory interneurons <coughs> of the antagonists. So, let us remember 1 a inhibitory interneurons inhibit the function. So, causing what we, we discussed this earlier we call this as disinhibition or in a way if they excite or they increase the probability that the antagonist muscle is going to get excited. Another form of negative feedback we saw this earlier. They also receive the inputs from the descending systems. They also Renshaw cells also receive descend inputs from the descending system. So, their excitability are modulated. So, can so it is possible to adjust the excitability the probability that the Renshaw cell will be excited ok. And uh, what is not discussed is uh, the case of 1 B interneuron. 1 B interneuron let us remind ourselves what are these cases uh, 1 A and 2 are muscle spindles and 1 B is coming from Golgi tendon organs. When will this be activated? Whenever a muscle is contracting if a muscle is contracting the tension in the tendon is going to increase when the tension in the tendon is going to increase the Golgi tendon organ is going to get activated and send proportional inputs in, in through its afferent and its afferent is called as 1 B neuron is not or called as 1 B afferent. This 1 B afferent so that means what that muscle is contracting then its negative feedback must be to relax that muscle is it not. That means, I should inhibit the alpha motor neuron that excites that muscle. Let us consider a single muscle, let us consider say the biceps right. 
if biceps is contracting it is one be afferent will find a way to must find a way to inhibit the alpha motor neurons that contract the biceps. But uh, let us remember that all proprioceptors by definition are excitatory they always excite. So, that means I cannot directly inhibit the alpha motor neuron. So, what this does is that there is an interneuron there is an interneuron which is called as the 1 B interneuron. So, the 1 B afferent excites a 1 B interneuron which inhibits the alpha motor neuron of the same muscle. So, unlike the 1 A case in the 1 A case stretching activates the 1 A afferent and it excites the alpha motor neuron of the same muscle causing it to contract okay. that is a monosynaptic response. In this case contraction activates uh, 1 B uh, afferent and uh, we have to inhibit the alpha motor neuron for that to happen it cannot do it directly it activates a 1 B interneuron which inhibits an alpha motor neuron. Okay. So, this is a disynaptic pathway. Okay. And so, that means this disynaptic pathway is uh, inhibiting disynaptic inhibition of which muscle not the opposite muscle inhibition of the not the inhibition of the opposite muscle is performed by the 1 year system inhibition of the same muscle are homonymous same muscle is happening same muscle is inhibited okay. and but it but the 1 B interneuron is receiving inputs not just from 1 B uh, afferent but also from other sources there is a great amount of convergence of uh, information that comes from various other sources leading to flexibility of uh, responses please do read about this. Okay. So, here is the example so there is a uh, uh, the Golgi tendon organ here that is uh, detecting the contraction of uh, this muscle. So, you want to you know relax this muscle so that is achieved through so that is the so through uh, an interneuron that is inhibiting this and you know the alpha motor neuron is inhibited. Okay. Now, what also happens is the special case of uh, locomotion versus resting. I said that uh, this system 1B system receives inputs not just from the 1B afferent, but also from multiple sources. It turns out that depending on the state the response can vary what actually happens during rest between rest and uh, locomotion of, uh, of a healthy animal healthy mammal say a cat is walking so for example, at rest the 1B afferent causes uh, inhibition of the homonymous muscle as one would ex expect right. But uh, during locomotion what happens is that there are others who come into the picture there are other excitatory interneurons that come into the picture that cause the same 1B uh, system to or the 1B afferent to cause an excitation in the extensor. So, this is called as this phenomenon has been widely studied and lots of data available on that this is called as the state dependent reflex reversal. So, the sign of the reflex can be changed depending on the context if I am lying down or if I am sitting in a chair right the reflex response is going to be something whereas, if I am walking for the same stimulus the response is going to be of the opposite sign sign as in S i g and sign is going to be in the opposite direction this is called as the state dependent reflex reversal especially is shown in the 1B system. Okay. Please do read about this discuss how are these things even studied 
um, how to study this. Sherrington invented a method to study these things, he called this, we will discuss the various preparations of animals that are studied in a future class, but however, I will just mention that uh, Sherrington invented a, um, what was at that time a novel method to study the uh, stretch reflexes. It turns out that if you transect the brain stem between the superior ca colliculus and the inferior colliculus. So, at the at the mid at the level of the mid brain between the superior and the inferior colliculus if you cut the system then what happens is uh, the reflex responses or the reflex input inputs provided by the brain stem are usually heightened. So, causing an amount of great amount of extensor tone or an amount of rigidity called as decerebrate rigidity. Even with the intact animal you do not have so much extensor muscle tone, but when the cut is made at that particular level between superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus, you will see that there is a great amount of uh, extensor muscle tone that is that is sufficient for the animal to support its body weight. Remember this animals. Uh, in this animal has been cut from its brain from its cortex from its motor cortex. So, uh, you would expect that it will go limp that is not what happens its body weight can be supported by this uh, muscle tone that is produced from the brain stem. This rigidity Sherrington called greatly as the famously as the decerebrate uh, oh, that is decerebrate rigidity okay, with the E. Uh, Google this, I mean definitely Google has a nice very beautiful paper in which he discusses it is also wonderful to read his language of uh, how he describes the situation. Okay. Uh, so, in that case what happens the reflex responses are heightened. So, then you can study, you can modulate, you can you can give specific stimuli and uh, study the responses. The responses are going to be of a higher amplitude than what you would find in an intact animal. This was the invention made by Sherrington way back about 100 years ago for uh, this. So, again um, and one again an experimental approach more, more details and other such preparations in future class in one particular future class. Okay. Another thing that is of interest for us is not just this there is more you know it is not only inhibition of the opposite muscle that is always desirable. Let us say that you know I am making a particular movement I want to excite the uh, you know muscle that is responsible and I want to inhibit the muscle that performs the opposite mechanical action. This is what you would usually consider yes that is an efficient uh, approach yet there are times when you want to uh, increase the stability or stiffness in such cases what happens is that you are interested in contracting simultaneously both the agonist and the antagonist thus increasing the apparent stiffness at that particular joint right. If I do that then what happens well this is something that you could experience. So, you know I want to ensure that suppose I am keeping my uh, arm like that and I want to ensure that nobody can you know push me away then what do I do. I activate a whole number of muscles both the agonist and the antagonist on both sides. When I do that if there is uh, a disturbance I am going to come back to that uh, you know the original state. So, um, or we want to reduce the probability that we are going to avoid a perturbation something like suppose I am carrying this cup let us suppose this is just a glass and I do not want to spill the hot liquid in there because it could it is it is embarrassing and it is also dangerous if it is hot enough it could cause injury for me is it not. So, I want to do that if I am walking without the cup if I am just walking without the cup or with a pen say for example, I am not going to have a heightened uh, co-contraction level or I am going to have relatively more uh, activation of the muscle that is responsible for that movement whereas, in this case there is going to be a greater amount of co-contraction that means, we should suspend the reflex responses and activate the other muscle. So, this is again possible. So, that means co contraction, right. This is again possible through descending inputs. Let us remember 
So, whenever I say descending inputs, where are these things coming from? These are coming from uh, actually what are the various sites in which you could modulate the, the you know the reflex responses. There are only three places in which you could modulate the reflex responses. Is it not? First is first is the alpha motor neuron, second is the the spinal interneurons, actually there are too many of them. And the third importantly is the presynaptic terminal of the afferent neurons. Now, let us remind ourselves of what this presynaptic business is. You know, if I would like to have an inhibition, right, it is possible for me to cause this inhibition postsynaptically or presynaptically, it is not. Postsynaptic inhibition is regular postsynaptic inhibition that is caused by inhibited neurotransmitters, etcetera, etcetera. And we, saw, we also saw a case of uh, you know inhibition that is caused through presynaptic uh, method, we discussed that uh, earlier. This is like having two knobs, right? Gross adjust or we as we see in some of the instruments that we operate, gross adjustment of gain and then fine adjustment of gain. The, so, inhibition can be uh, performed at a gross level for multiple uh, sites using a postsynaptic method or selectively for specific neurons using or fine adjustments using the presynaptic approach. Okay. All these three are possible. Now, I could change the response to reflex by modifying the tonic excitatory state. If the tonic membrane potential, tonic excitatory state is at that level, for a given reflex amplitude, it is going to take the membrane to that level of uh, this and there is going to be no response or response depending on what the threshold is. Now, if I change the descending input to change to take the membrane potential to that state right? and I supply the same amplitude reflex or the same amplitude stimulus that causes the reflex that could take the system to action potential and cause a response that is uh, you know measured. So, depending on the depending on the where the resting state is depending on whether the resting state is here or here the response will vary and the stimulus let us remember the stimulus remains a constant the stimulus is the same for the same stimulus depending on the excitatory inputs coming from the top coming from elsewhere the response can vary. So, but that this is something that the you know the higher centers control can control possibly control. The reflex response is ineffective then we can make it effective by changing the excitatory tone that is or that is already present in the system right. So, that is what and let us also remember one more thing that uh, whenever the alpha motor neuron is activated the gamma motor neurons are also simultaneously activated we said that and we call this as the alpha gamma co-activation. The earlier co-activation that I spoke just a few minutes ago is the co-contraction of two different muscles. This is alpha gamma co-activation where fibers of the same muscle extra fusal fibers and the intra fusal fibers of the same muscle are simultaneously activated. Okay. This is this we called as the alpha gamma co-activation. Okay. Now, let us remember what happens uh, we, we discussed this earlier the function of uh, the muscle spindle is it not when um, the fiber is stimulated right when the one year front or muscle spindle is uh, stimulated and there is a stretch that is or it could either be mechanically stimulated or could be electrically stimulated or when a stretch is caused like that there is going to be sustained response. And we let us also remember that there is both dynamic sensitivity that is adjusted by changing the input to the dynamic gamma motor neuron and static sensitivity that is 
So, depending on how I change the inputs to the dynamic gamma motor neuron and the static gamma motor neuron sensitivity of the one year system, I, the one year system can either function as a velocity sensor or a length sensor. Is it not? So, that is the response. Now, suppose I am contracting the muscle, hmm. I am contract, contracting the muscle. Now, what will happen in the absence of gamma motor input, right? I am causing a contraction of the muscle through electrical stimulation and I am activating only the, so that means only the alpha motor neuron is activated, only the, if the alpha motor neuron is activated, what you will see is some length being measured and uh, the length being measured after the contraction is over. During the contraction, this is silent. Why is this silent? Because the static sensitivity has not been adjusted, the gamma motor neurons are responsible for um, changing the static sensitivity have not been activated. Because of this reason, this remains silent. If I want to still measure length, what I should do? I could activate both alpha motor neuron and the gamma motor neuron. Earlier you see only the alpha motor neuron that is uh, activating the extra fusel fibers. Here simultaneous activation a simultaneous stimulation of both the alpha motor neuron and the gamma motor neuron both the extra fusel fibers and the intra fusel fibers. When both are done what you see as a difference from the previous picture is here it is silent whereas here it is still measuring length. So, experimentally we have confirmed the important role of uh, the gamma motor neurons something to remember. Okay. I could adjust the sensitivity by, so, but if I simultaneously active, uh, activate sim alpha and gamma motor neurons, I am going to get a response like this, which is considered normal response. This happens only in experimental situations. Isn't it? Okay. Now, another case is the case of um, long loop reflexes, the case of long loop reflexes. Now, what is this? Uh, this must somehow involve the higher brain centers. We will discuss what these higher brain centers are uh, later, but for now let us just say that there is um, a response that is measured at uh, relatively short latencies, which we are going to call as um, for want of better terminology as M1. Now, oh, what is this M1? If the muscle is stretched, there is going to be an immediate monosynaptic response to contract that muscle through mediated by the 1A afferent system. Okay. So, 1A afferent activates the alpha motor neuron and that response is found, say for example. This is what we call as H reflex, but if it also continues, right, there is going to be an improved response a more contextual response that is modulated from by inputs from the higher centers which is called as M2 or M23 or M2-3 etcetera etcetera lots of names. So, uh, let us not confuse this with the earlier terminology, earlier we called the early first response monosynaptic response as H reflex if it is electrically stimulated right and M response is the response that is directly coming through the motor neurons, M response uh, stands for M for motor neuron, direct activation of motor neuron causes M response. Here when there are multiple muscle responses, the first response is called as M1 monosynaptic response, M23 or M2 is a polysynaptic or a long loop response. Okay. The say for example, the right hand of this individual is controlled by the left, the contralateral side, the other side, the left motor cortex etcetera. So, the input is coming from this. The, the example that is given is what would happen in people with specific disorders where this uh, function, this integrity is compromised. Please do check this. I am not, uh, not going to explain this, please do check this syndrome, Klippel-Feil syndrome, please google this and see what will happen 
if you activate one uh, if you stretch one particular uh, um, one particular hand say the right hand muscle is uh, stretched m1 will be present in the response of uh, in the response of the right hand m2 3 will be present in the response of both hands why this happens please do check about that okay by this by, so again one second by carefully stimulating individual uh, systems or individual neurons or individual or groups of neurons and measuring simultaneously with of course synced responses at multiple sites we are able to come up with hypothesis on where the pathology is this is class, classical neurophysiology this is how it is done ok. So, please do read about this uh, please do google this and read about this yourself ok. So, one more thing so let us also remember remind ourselves of the total of the of what is uh, going on. So, alpha motor neuronal activity is uh, if this is the alpha motor neuronal activity it is going to get excitement from the cortical system or um, unfortunately, this also has the same name primary motor cortex which in future classes I will call as M1. It also controls gamma motor neurons which changes sensitivity of the spindle is it not. So, the external load if it is stretching right force produced overcomes that and the length information is measured by the spindle which activates this. So, this activation of the alpha motor neuron is not just through this or just through this it is actually through a combination of both these pluses is it not. So, let us let us see what happens is it not. In the case of reflexes it is only this plus that is acting in the case of uh, real everyday movements what is actually going on in real everyday movements is a combination of this. But you are not observing which one of these is contributing how much. So, you are only observing the net output, you are only observing the activity here, you are only observing the activity of the length, you are only observing the force that is produced. But it is produced by a combination of inputs, how much of this is due to reflex, how much of this is due to what component is due to what cause is uh, an important question that continues to be researched at multiple levels. Okay. So, in summary we have seen monosynaptic reflex we have reviewed that we have seen the case of one a interneuron we have re reviewed the case of uh, Renshaw cells inhibitory interneuron and the 1 b interneuron that causes uh, inhibition of the homonymous muscle, muscle and also receives inputs from multiple sites the case of stretch reflex and alpha gamma coactivation and long loop reflex pathways. We have also introduced the topic of flexor uh, withdrawal reflex and crossed extension reflex and we have discussed the concept of uh, co-contraction. Okay. We have still not done co-hyphen contraction, okay. we have still not done the case of um, oligosynaptic and polysynaptic reflexes the cases that are called as tonic or tonic stretch reflex. Okay and what is it how what is the difference between the regular stretch reflex and the tonic stretch reflex what is tonic about the tonic stretch reflex and uh, tonic vibration reflex. We had to discuss once again the case of flexor response and crossed extensor response these we will do in future classes. So, with this we come to the end of this class thank you very much.